Welcome to the chemisode or the second chemisode on DNA. This is deoxyribonucleic acid. This chemisode works on how we're going to use DNA. So it's part two of our DNA two-part series. Let's go have a look at DNA in action. Let's hear how we use it. Um, the interesting part about your DNA is that everyone's DNA is different. Everyone's DNA is unique to who they are. Their genetic code is all different to the person next to them. What this means is we can um, look around at different DNA and we can use it to identify people. We can use it to identify where they came from and we can identify um, sometimes where they were if we look at um, crime scene style um, analysis, so forensic analysis. So the order in which the bases line up, so the order in which DNA, um, the sequences are, that basically makes up our genetic makeup. The more related we are to someone else, so say um, we have my brother, would have a similar set of DNA to me because we both got our DNA from my parents. So people who are related to you have, <coughs> sorry, sections of DNA which are similar. This allows us to work out paternity, um, paternity cases in DNA. Also, you allows us to use it for forensic science, so analyzing DNA and looking at um, where it, um, analyzing DNA found at a crime scene, and then using it to match up with um, suspects that you might have. The DNA, the way that we analyze DNA for these two reasons, is done via a process called electrophoresis. Okay, basically electro meaning we use electricity, and phoresis, meaning I have no idea what, but um, electrophoresis is a way of separating DNA and analysing the different parts that make DNA up. Let's go have a look at how electrophoresis works. Basically, we have um, a five-part way of doing electrophoresis or analysing DNA. First, we need to collect our sample. So we collect our sample from a crime scene or something like that. We then need to reproduce our sample. Our sample size in um, DNA analysis is usually quite small. This is because um, at, at a crime scene or something like that, you can't collect a lot of um, a lot of evidence or a lot of DNA evidence from a crime scene. So what we need to do is reproduce our sample a lot. And even with uh, when we collect samples of DNA from people who are who are getting their DNA checked. If you look at paternity cases, even then your DNA sample is quite small because it's such a it's such a small amount of um, DNA in your in your cells. Once we reproduce the sample, we get enough to actually analyze it. What we do is we break DNA up into sections using things called restriction enzymes. Once it's broken into sections, then we can separate these sections or these segments using electrophoresis. And once it's um, had electrophoresis done to it, the analysis is in a similar way to paper chromatography or TLC, thin layer chromatography, in that we're looking at for um, a similar pattern with our electrophoresis or our DNA samples. Let's go have a look at these um, five items in a bit more detail. First of all, collection of the sample. Basically, to collect a sample of DNA, we need some body tissue. So that can be done through a, um, a cheek swipe or a cell swipe. Um, it also can also be done if we're looking at blood. Um, even though red blood cells don't have a nucleus, inside your blood you have other areas. So you have like your white blood cells and stuff like that, which you can actually collect DNA from as well. So any body tissue will give you a good sample of DNA. Cheek cells um, are usually what we do it with um, in terms of analysis. So collecting sample of DNA, you collect some bodily tissue. Once your sample is collected, as I said before, you need to reproduce your sample. We reproduce it using this thing called PCR, or poly polymerase chain reaction. This involves three steps. Basically, DNA is a self-reproducing molecule. It means it, it can reproduce itself. The way it works is um, what we have to do is, first of all, we have DNA bonded together in hydrogen bonds between the two bases here. Once we heat that up, we can actually denature our DNA and break those hydrogen bonds. So we separate the two strands of DNA. We do this at about 95 degrees Celsius for I think it's about five minutes or so. I can't remember exactly how long it is, but it's not long anyway. So we heat DNA up, it breaks the hydrogen bonds and puts it into the two separate um, chains. So we, 
we have two chains here. The next process is called annealing where we cool it down to about 55 degrees. Once we cool it down, what happens is um, we get these primers being added to the ends of each sequence. So once this breaks apart, we get these primers which can start to build back the DNA that's been denatured. So cooling it down to 55 degrees adds the primers to start this reaction off. Afterwards, what we end up with is this elongation process, which is back up to 71 degrees. And what this, the complementary base pairs get added to your DNA. So it basically rebuilds the structure back to what it was originally. So what's happened is each time we um, heat it and cool it, we get an extra chain of DNA happening, an extra sequence. It basically multiplies it by two. Um, every time we do that, as I said, it increases by a factor of two. So if we start off with just two strands of DNA, once around this process will give me four. The second time we do this process will give me eight. The third time will give me 16. Third, um, after that, 32, 64, 128, 250. Um, six and so on and so forth. So it completely it doubles each time we do this set of reactions and this is to reproduce DNA. So from one strand of DNA after a few times in this as you can imagine we get more and more and more strands of DNA. So this is the reproduction area where we use a polymerase chain reaction which reproduces DNA so we get a larger sample size. Once we have got a, enough sample, enough DNA to actually analyze it, what we do is we put it into our electro... Sorry, no we don't. We have to break our DNA up. Sorry about that. Step three is breaking our DNA up using these things called restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes basically break DNA into smaller segments by cutting it at a certain sequence of nitrogen bases or a segment se sequence of nitrogen bases. So basically every time that in our DNA we get a TGA, this is for example, it's just not it's not actually happening this way, but for example, we get the certain sequence TGA, what these restriction enzymes will do is cut it, cut our DNA at that section there. And it will cut it into different length chains. So DNA gets broken down using restriction enzymes, which cut DNA at a certain sequence of um, for nitrogen bases. Now it's broken into smaller segments. We can actually analyze it and put it into our electrophoresis machine. I um, got a bit ahead of myself before. But here is electrophoresis. Basically, we hook a, a set of gel, some electrophoresis gel, like um, it's a special type of agar, I think it is. Um, up to some electric current. We have a negative at one end and a positive at the other end. Notice that DNA here, um, the backbone of DNA is negatively charged. This means that when we apply electric current to it, it'll try and move away from the negative end here and move towards the positive end. So when we go and switch on our electrophoresis machine, this is what happens. You can see that different segments or different um, bits of DNA have moved different amounts. The rate that they move is to do with molar mass. So the molar mass has to do with how far they move through here. The smallest molar mass, which means there's a lot, the shortest chain of um, DNA, will move the furthest. So if you have a large molar mass, it won't move as far, so it'll be down this end. If you have a small molar mass, it will be more so up the top end here. <clears throat> That's because it takes a lot more effort to move a larger molecule through this gel. Electrophoresis, um, if you have similar DNA to someone else, you'll have similar segments. So you'll have bands of DNA that will be at a certain area. So here's a way of analysing our DNA. Basically, I've got it around a game show, or well, it's not really a game show, it's a reality TV show in the US, which is called Who's Your Daddy? Um, it's where they get a few different um, people. So they get a mother and a child, and they get three people who might be the father of that child, and they try and work out who actually is the father of this child. Um, it's a pretty horrible TV show, really. It's a pretty horrible game show. Um, but... The idea is, 
um, there. So let's have a look at this. Basically, if you are related to someone, you'll have similar bands of DNA. So you can see here that our child has um, a electrophoresis or the, the DNA sequence like this. These two match up with the mother. So you can see that the child's DNA, part of that DNA has come from the mother here. What we want to look at is which one is the father. Now, person one, so suspected dad number one, has no matches of DNA. So this suspect one is not related to the child at all. Suspect two, on the other hand, has match here and a match here. So suspect two sounds like or looks like he might be related to this child. That's a good line because he has no matches with the, um, the mother and the two parts of DNA which haven't come from the mother actually match up with suspect two here. Suspect dad number three, obviously this doesn't really match up. It's, it's a close match, but it's not. This part here doesn't match up. It actually matches up with suspect one, so maybe suspect one and three are related. Who knows? Suspect three here, yep, probably related to suspect one, but not the child. Might actually also be related to the mother, all right, because they have this um, matching up here. Suspect three probably is related to the mother, but probably not to the child. Maybe this part of DNA has been passed on to the mother and then passed on to the child. So maybe suspect three is um, a bit, um, might be related to the family somehow, but not necessarily is the father as child because these two parts of the child's DNA have not come from um, the father, which is probably number two because it matches up where the DNA is. This isn't the best um, example, it's just one I've quickly put together, but you get the idea. If you can match up these um, sets of DNA or these um, electrophoresis results, you can get an idea about paternity um, and who the father or mother of a child might be. You can also use this for um, forensics analysis where um, if you have a 100% match basically, you'll get an idea about who might have been at the crime scene and whose blood you are actually looking at and so on and so forth. But that's it for DNA. Um, that's the end of DNA. I should actually note that we do, there is a little bit of um, information on genetic diseases that, that is covered in the textbook. I'm not going to go over that in detail in these podcasts, in these videos, but there is some information on genetic diseases. I might go and do a bit more of that information in the audio podcast on genetic diseases. But I don't think it's really worth uh, mentioning too much in these videos. But you should know that DNA can also be used to look at genetic diseases where you have um, faults in your, in your DNA or you have too many chromosomes or too little chromosomes. So there's genetic diseases for you in a nutshell where you have um, issues with your DNA. That's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. And next set of podcasts, the next two podcasts that we're going to do will be on medicines. So one will be on aspirin and the other one will be on penicillin. So stay tuned to those.